Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar titled, The Benefits and Values of Inclusive Education. Marianne Calparetto from the New Jersey Coalition for, for Inclusive Education will discuss the history of the disability movement, current research regarding the benefits of inclusive education for all students with and without disabilities, the best way to include students with disabilities in the general edu education classroom, and one child's journey to inclusion along with the benefits from that choice. She will also discuss how participants um, can use review tools for working through IEP team conflicts, such as solution circles. While acknowledging the need for education around specific topics, such as today's presentation, the Family Support Center in New Jersey also recognizes that families have specific questions around their child's transition years. The Transition Matters website assists families and professionals in identifying resources to successfully transition your child or students with special needs to adulthood. Resources such as webinars, in-person workshops, and statewide and regional contact information are made available on this site. We encourage you to explore this site further and register for any upcoming sessions that you may be interested in. Before we begin, let's take a moment to go over how you can participate during today's web event. Everyone has their own control panel in the upper right corner of their screen that looks similar to the one here. Use the orange arrow to open or hide the control panel. To listen to the webinar, you have two audio options to choose from, mic and speakers and telephone. If you can't hear well using your computer speakers, you can elect to use your telephone to listen to today's session. In order to maintain the best sound quality possible, all but the presenters will be muted throughout the webinar. If you have questions or comments, you can submit them using the questions panel. All questions will be collected and answered at the end of the webinar as long as time allows. At this time, I would like to introduce this afternoon's presenter, Marianne Comparetto. Marianne, welcome. Hi. And Marianne, you should see a prompt on your screen to accept control. Yep, I do. Perfect. Just give me a second to pull my screen up. So hopefully you can see that. Is you that can. good? Really? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody today about the benefits and values of inclusive education. I do want you to sort of write down any questions you have, and as Melanie indicated, if we have time at the end, which hopefully we will, I will try to get to as many of those questions as possible because I understand that sometimes the issues are very specific to a specific child, situation, or disability. So I want to certainly, hopefully, be able to address as many of those as I can at the end. So first I'm going to talk about why inclusion. I'm going to talk a little bit about my particular frame of reference on this topic, a little bit about the laws and research behind it, the purpose of the law, and then what inclusion looks like, and we'll get more into the um, nuts and bolts of it at that point. So this is my family. I have two, of three children. My oldest daughter is 18, and my two other children are 10 and 11 years old. And this is my oldest daughter, Laura. She has autism, and she was diagnosed when she was about two years old, and then she's cognitively impaired as well, and she has a seizure disorder. So um, when I talk about inclusion, my frame of reference, as I said before, really does come from Laura. That was the first person that taught me about inclusion, and especially about the benefits of it for her. Um, so as I mentioned, Lara was diagnosed when she was 18 months old, and I had not heard the word inclusion at that point. But I did know from a very early age that I wanted her to be in an environment around her typical peers. I wanted her to have access to those positive peer models. I wanted her to be able to make academic progress as well as social progress. And to me, in her academic career, it's always been a balance between sometimes taking a little bit of an academic hit to gain some social benefits and vice versa. Um, but I will preface that with I do believe that every parent has a right to make what's correct choice for their child, and inclusion is not a perfect fit for everybody. It is certainly not a one-size-fits-all solution, and by no means is it an easy uh, path to travel down. Um, I do think that parents need to be uh, very involved, especially if you're going to go down an inclusion path, to sort of stay on, on top of it. And at the same time, it's an ongoing thing. It's not black and white. What 
what might look like inclusion in one room, you know, changes as the kid gets, as the child gets older. It changes in the environment that they're in, in the classroom that they're in. So it certainly, you know, weaves and bobs a little bit as you go along. I do want you to keep in mind as we talk today about the ultimate goals in special education. What are they? What was the ultimate? What is the ultimate goal of teachers when they're teaching students in special education? Is it a place for students who have physical or mental challenges? <laughs> is it a place for students who bother teachers? Is it a place for students to work on specialized skills? I should have admitted the sound effects, I'm sorry. Is it a place for students to be with other students who have similar challenges? So the answer is obviously none of the above. It was a trick question. Special, special education is a service, it's not a place. So for those of you who are already aware of that, I'm sorry for being redundant, but it, some people do think that special education is a place in a school. They think it's a special ed room down the hall or a special education school specifically for that disability. But that's not what special education is. It's a service. It's providing access from a child with a disability to the curriculum, access to that education. It's through services, through support. So the first way for them, for children to get that is through IDEA, which was a law that was enacted back in the 70s. Oops, hold on. I went too far. Hold on. Um, ensuring equal the equality of opportunity for all students. So they can have participation, they can live independently, so that they can have the, the most opportunity that they can have regardless of their disability. That was the reason that that law was enacted. This is just a quote that I like from Albert Einstein. So there is no special education line at the supermarket. That's a term that many people have heard over and over again. And I use it because it's still really relative. You know, I say that to people, especially people who are looking at having their child included. I'll have parents who will call me with a very young child and an issue regarding a very young child and they, and they have that child in maybe a self-contained classroom and they think that is a good solution for them when they're younger. And as I said, every student is individual. Every disability is different. So it is what you think is best for your child. But I do, want, I do try to strive to get parents to think long term. I try to get parents to think along the lines of what used to be a financial commercial that you'd see on television with the green line in terms of your retirement. And on that commercial, they would talk about how if you're looking to retirement, you stay on this green path and we will get you to your ultimate goal. If you weave off of that path, our goal is to bring you back on it. So I look at that when I'm thinking about my child and I try to get other parents to do the same thing, that when you're looking at your child's education, Think about where you envision your child at the age of 21. Where do you see them living, working, being a part of a community? What does that look like to you? And if it's in an environment that is inclusive, if it's independent in some capacity, then you have to work backwards a little bit. It's difficult to get there if your child spends their entire academic career around only other people with disabilities and has very little access to typical peers that does make it more difficult when they are out of the school system to then be able to assimilate in a community. So my goal in talking about the benefit and the value of an inclusive education is to talk about sort of long-term, thinking long-term, keeping that goal in mind of where you see your child, and then working a little bit backwards about how do we get there. What steps do I need to take now, even at a young age of five or six, to get my child on the path that I want them to be on so that when they're 21, they can be as independent as possible for them, living happily, doing a job they enjoy, being in a community of people that hopefully support them, having friends and a social life, if that's what you envision for your child. Um, so, so that is my purpose in showing this particular slide because I think about that, that there's not just a supermarket just for individuals with disabilities to go to. It's a part of a community, so we have to learn how to adapt to that. So the path to the inclusion in the past. So, um, hold on, I need to move this out of the way a little bit. Okay, so we group people in the past with disabilities, with others who had disabilities in institutions, in schools, in work, home, rec centers, because we thought their needs were similar and that would require the same support. We thought people with disabilities would feel more comfortable with others with disabilities and similar needs. 
I know when I went to school and I was much younger, there was always this special education room down the hall. And that's where all the kids who were different went. And, you know, nowadays they still have that in a lot of schools and a lot of classrooms are still like that. But kids are more um, included now. Kids are more in part of the regular community and you see them more. And so I think that it's important to note that there has been a difference. Not as much as we would like, but there has been some changes. So what we found through research is that individuals learned how to act like other people with disabilities and were not able to function well in a society because they had not learned how to act socially appropriate. So that's what the research has shown is that kids learn what they're around. It's the same thing with typical kids. If you put typical kids and they're just like your parents used to tell you who you hang out with is how you'll behave sort of, you know, it's the same same situation. If typical kids are around a, a gang environment and those children are using bad language and committing criminal acts and behaving inappropriately, of course not every person is going to do the same thing, but your child is more inclined to behave the same way and act the same way as the peers that they associate with. It's the same thing with kids with disabilities. If they're surrounded by other children with disabilities all the time and don't have the access to typical children and typical behaviors, positive role models, then the kids are going to pick up the behaviors of those other people around them. That's what the research has shown. Of course, nothing is black and white. Nobody 100% fits into that category, but that is what the majority of the information and the research that we found has shown. So inclusion, because people will ask me, well, what does inclusion look like? So technically, inclusion is the placement of children with disabilities in a gen ed classroom for all significant parts of the school day. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. So a philosophy that all children can learn a powerful idea, it meets the needs of each child with a disability, and it's made on an individual basis. So what this does not mean is that when it says the placement of children into a gen ed classroom for significant parts of the school day, a lot of schools and a lot of parents will tell me that the school has suggested that their child get included for specials and for lunch and recess. Um, like for art, music, band, that sort of thing, and then for lunch and recess, but all academic subjects, they're in a special education room. So th the reason I'm bringing this up is the problem I have with that is typically our special needs kids have the most difficulty in situations that are unstructured, and you find that in classrooms that are like band and music, lunch and recess, those are the times of the day that are the most social, and they're the most unstructured of the day. And kids with disabilities usually have the most difficulty in social situations and with, un with a lot of unstructured, unsupervised time. And so I tend to think that when schools put children included just during those times of the day, sometimes those children who are going to have difficulty have the most difficulty. And then schools will say, we tried it, it didn't work, and they'll want to come back and sort of, you know, talk again about placement. The research that we have done at NJCIE tends to find that kids that are included in academic subjects first, more like science class, you know, if they're really young and they have like a reading, uh, reading circle in the morning or circle time in the morning, things like that where kids can assimilate better, the curriculum lends itself more to group instruction, that kids not only get the positive peer interaction, but there's more structure there's a little bit of social interaction, but not quite as much as you have at lunch and recess, a limited amount, but it gives kids a greater opportunity to have less behaviors, but at the same time access to the curriculum and access to positive peer role models. So with inclusion, it's a philosophy, it's an instructional approach, certainly an attitude, absolutely a planning approach and a process. It is not a place, there's not an inclusion room, there's not an inclusion school, because inclusion can look different for each child. What does the word inclusion mean to you? And what do you think it means for your child, for your student, or for other students? So when I say this, usually I, if I'm doing this in a group situation, I'll ask people to write that down and give me those, that information. And if we have time to address that at the end, I certainly would. But I do that because everybody has, a lot of people have different ideas about what they think inclusion looks like. And I think it's important to sort of realize that you have to think about the child that you're discussing, their particular disability or behavior issues, and then the environment that you want them to go to. How do you have to make those two mesh? 
So when you're thinking about the child, you think about the disability that that child has. What types of supports do they currently need that help them to become more, um, uh, be able to facilitate better in a situation with peers? So you think about all of those things and think, can those things be transferred to a general education class? And that's the best way to sort of try to make, to start making a plan for a child in a gen ed classroom. You look at the classroom, what supports are currently available there now, what's already in place that we don't have to change, and then what supports are, do we have that are portable, that we can bring in? What are we doing outside of the classroom that's working that we can bring in to the classroom? Students with disabilities show greater achievement and results in segregated settings. So I want you to think whether or not you think that's true or false. So 30 years of research and experience have shown that education of children with disabilities can be made more effective by having high expectations for children, ensuring their access to the general education curriculum in a regular classroom to the maximum extent possible. The key word there is the maximum extent possible. It doesn't mean that a child is not included if they're not in a gen ed classroom all day. Research says overwhelmingly shows that students with disabilities, when included in a gen ed class, make greater academic progress. And that is true because I think they're held to a higher bar in a gen ed classroom regardless, regardless of their needs. You know, as I mentioned before, I have a daughter that was 18 that has um, cognitive disabilities and autism. She was included her entire school career. And she, even though, like I said, that she has an intellectual disability, her curriculum was modified sometimes more significantly than others in the gen ed classroom. So, and we can, I can talk about that more if we have time at the end, but um, it was a difficult situation, especially as she got into the higher level grades to keep her included because the material would, of course, become more difficult and she had not risen to the level of the other kids in the classroom. But we use the benefit of technology and iPads and we were able to modify curriculum and modify her work where it didn't, other kids did not know that she had different work than they did or that the work had been modified so significantly for her so that she could be in the classroom, have access to positive peer models, have the ability to get that higher level of vocabulary that you sometimes find in a gen ed classroom. The teachers held her to a higher level of expectation because she was in there. I think she felt smarter because she was in that classroom. And I think she gained a lot of not just social skills, but I think she gained a lot of academic skills as well by having greater access to a curriculum that she would not have had had she been taught in a different environment. Placement in inclusive programs led to academic gains for students with disabilities, including improved performance on standardized tests, mastery of IEP goals, grades, on-task behavior and the motivation to learn. One that I look at the most there is really motivation to learn because I really think that's a kicker. For me, when my daughter was much younger, she used to ask me, why do I have to go down the hall? Because as I said, inclusion is a process. She didn't start off 100% included all the time. She would be pulled into resource rooms. She would be pulled into other classrooms to get therapy or what have you. And we slowly tried to bring as much of those services into the classroom as we can or as we could over the years. But she was highly motivated to be in the classroom with her peers. Not all kids are like that. And I, I do say that with experience. As I said, I have three children and my middle daughter has some learning disabilities. She prefers a smaller group mm -hmm. setting. So as much as I believe in inclusion, and I do, I also believe that every student deserves an individual plan. And so for my middle daughter, what works for her is being taught in a resource room or a different room where there's less children. She doesn't feel quite as much anxiety or pressure. She gets a smaller group instruction and, and she still has access to the curriculum, but it's on a much slower pace that she can handle for some of her academic subjects. So I do think you have to look at your child and their specific needs and then find what best fits for them. Students with disabilities educated in inclusive classrooms typically test higher on literacy measures than students educated in separate classrooms. That really basically comes down to the higher level of vocabulary that you find in a general education class versus a special education class. A lot of times what you'll find in a special education class is the level of vocabulary tends to 
you know, wean itself down to the lowest level in the room. That's what I have found over the years. So kids who are in a general education classroom tend to have access to not only the students' higher vocabulary, but the, the teacher as well. Students with any disability show greater achievement in academic progress when they're in inclusive settings. There's no research that supports the provision of self-contained classrooms or separate schools as a means of offering a place in which students will have greater progress than in the neighborhood schools. So I think this is my last slide on research, and then I'm going to hopefully give you some more um, information that I think will be more beneficial. But students with severe multiple disabilities may appear to have such challenging impairments, and their needs appear to either be so basic or complex that teaching these students in highly academic, typical classrooms seems improbable and at the least impractical. But research and best practice shows that these students perform better socially and academically in less restrictive environments with numerous spontaneous opportunities to interact with peers. So what I'm going to say here is, if you haven't, you can look this up after the, um, this webinar today, but there is a great video that specifically addresses this slide here. It's called Including Samuel. And you can Google that. You can usually get either, if not free, you can get a huge excerpt on it on the YouTube or online. Um, but it specifically shows a child with multiple disabilities, the child has cerebral palsy and some other issues going on, and they show him included in a gen ed classroom. And what I like about the video that I think really screams out to me is you see how much it benefits not just the child Samuel, but the peers around him. His peers really do rally around him, they enjoy supporting him, they like sitting next to him, helping him with his wheelchair, helping him with his books helping him if he has a behavior issue. And I think that that is what I have found, especially with kids with multiple disabilities, kids with medical issues, or kids with um, ambulatory issues. I think that you know, kids in that environment, typically schools sometimes, will think they're much, it's better for them if they're in this special classroom. We can offer so much more direct support. But what I have found when I've seen kids included, included correctly with the right supports, I have seen those children flourish in an inclusion environment. I've seen peers flock to them. I've seen the other kids in the classroom really benefit by having a child with a disability in that room. It teaches them a lot about community. It teaches them a lot about what it means to be a part of a school community, what it means to help a peer, what it means to you know, help some, another human being, because that's what it's like when they get out of school. That's what our community is like. We don't live in a community where everybody is just like us. We live in a community where sometimes you have to support a neighbor or a colleague. And I think it's important for our kids to learn that, that school is supposed to replicate what the world is like to some degree, to help teach these children when they get out of school how to behave in the real world. So I think including Samuel is a great example of that. And if you get a chance to see any of that video, I certainly would um, ask you to look that up because it's a great example, better than anything I could tell you about a benefit and value of what inclusive education can look like when it's done correctly. I do emphasize correctly because inclusion done wrong is, is not good for anybody. It, a child needs to be supported properly. So placement in an inclusive classroom does not interfere with the academic performance of students without disabilities. So I'm going to describe this in a second, but placement in an inclusive classroom does not interfere with an academic performance of students without disabilities with respect to the amount of allocated time and engaged instructional time, the rate of interruption for planned activities, and the student's achievement on test scores. So the findings indicate that the performance of students without disabilities was equal or better than that of a gen ed student who's in a classroom that not, does not have a child with a disability. And I really think it lends itself to what I was just talking about, that kids who are in a classroom with a child that has a disability, it, they really benefit greatly from all the things that they're exposed to. They benefit from, the, like I said, the opportunity to help another child, another student, to gain that ability to learn that. Everybody likes to know that they can help somebody and feel needed, and kids are no different. It makes, feel, makes kids feel important. It makes them feel worthwhile when they can help somebody and they can, you know, make somebody's day and at the end of that day go home and say, wow, you know, Samuel was in my room today and I was the one who got to push his chair up in the circle time and I was the one who got to help him with his book. 
it, it really does um, teach our kids a lot about compassion and being a part of a school community. The other thing I was going to say about that is that typically in classrooms where there's a child with a disability, you tend to have not only greater supports in that classroom and greater access to the, the when they're in there and they're learning the curriculum, there's usually more tools that are brought in and more different ways that the teacher is trying to teach this lesson to, in order to get all the students to be able to learn it. So the kids without disabilities benefit from that higher level support as well, even if they don't directly need it. So the rule about not too little, not too much, just right, is certainly important with our little people with disabilities because you don't want to give kids so much support that they don't have an opportunity to challenge themselves and grow. You want to give them just enough that they're challenged but not frustrated. That is a very hard balancing act, sometimes a tightrope act at times that you have to find. What does it look like? Implementing inclusive IEPs in a least restrictive environment. So this is an example of what it does not look like. <laughs> Islands in the Mainstream is a very popular comic that's used for a lot of people who present on disability issues. Obviously in the back of the room, the person with the wheelchair sits and all the rest of the room sit in the front. So that, that's exactly what is not the case. And when my daughter was first included in New Jersey, she was sat at what I used to call the disability table. The school thought they were doing a great job. They let me come in and tour the room and they thought that they were doing a wonderful job of including her. But she was sitting at a table with another child with a disability and the aide was right there at the table helping them and they were in a gen ed classroom. But what she didn't realize is that that was just like sitting her at the special education table in a general education room. Instead of just letting her be a part of the room like everybody else and having that support person help the entire classroom. Because ideally when you walk by a classroom with a child with a disability, if the child doesn't have an outside visible disability, you shouldn't be able to tell what child is receiving the service. It should just flow very seamlessly where the support staff and the teacher work together in conjunction at delivering the information to the students in a way that works for all the students, not just the child with a disability. So least restrictive environment refers to the general education class. It means to the maximum extent appropriate, children are taught and educated with children who are not disabled. I always tell parents, think about where would your child go to school and what classroom would they be in if they did not have an identified disability. That is the least restrictive environment. Placement in the least restrictive environment, things that they're not supposed to consider when they're determining placement for your child. They're not supposed to determine whether or not the student can progress at a level that is close to the other kids in that classroom. They're not supposed to consider what your child's disability label is or the amount of space, staff, or services that are currently available, the convenience of it for the school, or the attitudes of the non-disabled peers or the teachers. Those are factors that are not supposed to come into play when they're determining placement for your child. So when you think of an IEP, you're supposed to think of it as a strategic plan. I know that's not what everybody thinks of. A lot of people get scared, especially if they've never had one before. They automatically think they have to go to battle. But hopefully I'll be able to give you some tips at the end about how to avoid that situation. Um, I do think it's important for you to know the roles of the people that will be at your IEP meeting. There's a general education teacher that's always present at an IEP meeting, a special education teacher and a paraprofessional. These are people that can be at the meeting, the paraprofessional. Um, so a gen ed teacher is the content person. They, they're the ones that um, have the activities that they'll use to master the curriculum. The special education teacher, if they're in a classroom with a gen ed teacher, they work together in conjunction. That's how it's supposed to work. So you want to be able to connect a child's needs to the resources. So the benefit of collaboration in problem solving. So when you're at an IEP meeting and you're having issues with the team, okay, for, which is very common, obviously. So you might want to ask what is the problem? Define the problem by determining the discrepancy be between what's expected and what's occurring. You might want to ask what, why is this taking place? What are we going to do about it? Or is this working? 
you want to make sure that you avoid saying things that are automatically argumentative or put people on the defensive. So a planning team that includes a general education teacher at a child's grade level, a special education teacher, and the parent. Those are the roles I just showed you a minute ago. You want to make sure that you're always following the gen ed curriculum. I tell parents to be prepared, parents, and that when you go to any IEP meeting previous to going to that meeting, make sure you have a copy of the curriculum. You can get it at your Board of Ed office if it's not available on your particular district's website. In my district, because it's a small district, I have to go to the Board of Ed office and pay per page to have it duplicated. Um, but I think it's important to know where your kids are supposed to be, even if they're far from that. It's at least an idea to know this is where they're supposed to be, this is where they are. Try to figure out a bridge to get them as close to that as you can, or what kinds of activities are we going to be doing to get them as close to the curriculum as possible. You want to make sure that they have access to that curriculum all the time. And it's difficult to be at an IEP meeting talking about the curriculum and what's expected of your child if, as a parent, you don't know what that curriculum consists of. So I really do think it's important for all parents to be knowledgeable and to be aware of what their particular curriculum is for that year for their child. This is something we use at NJCIE. A lot of school districts have something similar to this. They might call it something different. Um, we use this as sort of a cheat sheet for schools, and I've never had a school district or an um, IEP team reject this when I presented it at a meeting. Um, it doesn't come across as something that they would look at as aggressive or stepping on their toes in any way, shape, or form. I always present it as a cheat sheet for the school. So what this is in front of you is a student profile sheet. I usually fill this out as much as I can in advance of the meeting. In, just in sort of thinking about time, because we all know IEP meetings are limited in the amount of time you're usually given. So, and I would fill these out for each academic subject that my child was in, and of course, non-academic subjects. So the idea behind this is, for instance, let's say your child has a lot of issues, behavioral or sensory issues. So for my gym teacher, I would fill this out and say, you know, she doesn't like the loud sound of the basketball hitting the um, gym floor, or she doesn't like the smell of the, you know, the ball, the rubber of the ball, you know, any little thing like that, I would put all of that on this sheet. I would put how we address her behavior issues, things that work or don't work, but I would make this sheet specific to the teacher I was giving it to. The idea is that when a teacher has your child come to their room, of course they're supposed to read the entire IEP, but sometimes our IEPs are lengthy. And sometimes these teachers only have your student once a week for one class. So by having something like this set up, a teacher can look at this and sort of get the nuts and bolts about what's in the IEP. Of course, we're not saying they shouldn't read the IEP, but this gives them a very concise and clear picture of your child and sort of, okay, these are really the sort of nuts and bolts of what I have to remember when they're in my classroom. These are the goals we're working on. These are how I might handle those goals. These are supports and strategies that are going to be the most helpful. And these are specific behavior things that I might want to keep in mind. And it, it just really gives them a, a quick overview of your child in a way that I think teachers appreciate. So I would usually do this for any teacher that had her, especially for a short period of time. And I think they always felt that it was useful. I mean, I never had someone come back and tell me that it wasn't a helpful tool. Create a schedule of daily activities for the class. So this is a good activity to do, especially if you're having discrepancies or disagreements with your school. I'm sorry, let me see if I can use that. I apologize. Um, so it, this is a, the best way to sort of try to figure out supports for a student and the school might be disagreeing with placement. So what we do at NJCIE is we would come in and create a schedule for the day, and we might even break it up into 15-minute increments. What happens when that child leaves your home until they come home? You go through every 15 minutes, and you might be so specific as to say, okay, they get on the bus when they leave my house. Do they need any support when they get on that bus? Is there anything that the school needs to be doing when we have behavior issues? Do they need, are they able to get on and off the bus by themselves? Do they need help with that? Can they take their book bag and take it off and hang it up? What kind of support they need? And that way, if you go through it every day, every 15 minutes of the day, 
it's easier for the school to identify supports in small increments like that as opposed to looking at the whole day can be a little overwhelming. But you break it up into small incremental parts of the day and it's a little easier for the school to address support needs. And this is just an example of what that schedule might look like. And this is what we would do if we were coming into a school to do sort of an inclusion plan for a student. So again, if you're working with your IEP team and you're trying to address issues and get through discrepancies, you want to have a discussion with the staff, but you want to keep that discussion going in a positive direction. You don't want it to become something that becomes very argumentative. So you might ask questions about accessing the curriculum or accommodations or modifications, and you want to make sure that you word those questions in a way that, in, hopefully, in a way that everybody sort of works together and doesn't feel judged or because it, immediately those meetings can turn argumentative. And people can de get defensive very quickly. So these are two slides that talk a lot about the difference between accommodations and modifications. People tend to get those very confused. They have a difficult time remembering the difference between what an accommodation and what a modification is. So hopefully these will give you guys a better idea of that. Um, hold on, I'm going to get through. Try to speed this up a little bit. So when I think of accommodations, I think about how it changes the way a child gets information, demonstrates learning, providing access to learning and the level of the playing field. You don't fundamentally change instruction, the level or content or performance criteria. That's accommodations. It's more, I think of it more as environmental. Okay. Modifications are very different. Modifications, you can change what a student is expected to learn or demonstrate. Other different standards within the same curriculum, it may fundamentally alter the instructional level or content. So when I said my daughter had a modified curriculum, that is why she was able to be in a classroom in 11th grade math even though she was doing math on a third or fourth grade level. They modified that curriculum significantly. We used the iPad and apps to help bridge a little bit of that and she used technology to sort of help some of that. But Absolutely, it was modified because her intellectual needs were so much lower than the other kids in that classroom. We still wanted her to have access to what they were doing, but on a level that was appropriate for her. So these are, again, giving you examples of the difference between modifications and accommodations. So um, I, I'll give an example here again of a modification. So if you were doing a spelling test for a child with a disability and you are modifying that spelling test, instead of just yelling out the, the teacher might say the word out loud and the kids would write the spelling word. A child with a disability, maybe the teacher gives them a pre-printed piece of paper with three words. One of those words is the spelling word. The other two are the spelling words spelled incorrectly. And the student has to circle the correct word spelled correctly. So they're sort of prompted or they're giving multiple choice instead of having to come up with the answer completely on their own. Um, that's what a modification would be. An accommodation might be something like they schedule breaks, have breaks scheduled into their day. They have um, equipment, materials, or a presentation, or the way that their response, the way that they respond to material is, mod is accommodated for. So again, I said I like to think of it more as environmental and things that surround the child versus the way the child learns and the way that they submit information. That's the way that is easier for me. Whatever works for you is great, but this is a good way to sort of decipher the difference between accommodation and modification. So another problem solving technique that I work with with parents is a solution circle. The descriptions are in here. If you want a copy of this, if you email me or if you ask for it during the end of the presentation, I can email you the directions for this. It's something that takes a lot longer than we have time today to discuss, but it's a good way to resolve conflict. It's effective when you get really stuck in an IEP meeting about a problem and you can't get past it. But to give you a brief overview of it, you have somebody who presents a problem, you have a facilitator who keeps time, you have a note taker, and you have brainstormers, which are everybody else in the room. So, and again, I'm going to keep this as brief as I can. 
So the problem presenter starts talking about the problem. Nobody else interrupts. They give the problem. Nobody else can say anything. Somebody's taking notes that whole time. Then at the end of that, after everybody, after the person has taken a sufficient amount of time and they've said the problem, then everyone else, before the time is up, will then have an opportunity to chime in and brainstorm with ideas and suggestions. They can only be positive, they can't be negative, and the problem presenter is not allowed to rebuff them or say anything. The problem presenter has to be quiet while the um, people brainstorming give their solutions. Then after those two events have occurred, then the group can have a dialogue that the problem presenter oversees where they explore and clarify ideas. Again, you're trying to keep this very positive. You don't, th you don't focus on things that can't be done or things that have already, be already been done. And then the final thing is you decide what is doable in the first three days. Because research has shown that if somebody doesn't do it in the first three days, they usually won't. So you get somebody from the group to follow up and make sure that you're trying to address whatever was resolved or agreed upon within the first three days. If you have a hard time saying what you mean, write your thoughts and ideas down and read or pass them out at a meeting. I do think this is really helpful. I sometimes have come to a meeting with an agenda or certain ideas written down, and sometimes in IEP meetings things can get emotional and heated, so it is beneficial if you, if you are better at keeping things in writing for you to try to write things down, especially if your meetings tend to get heated or argumentative. The importance of family involvement. The evidence is beyond dispute that when schools and families work together, support learning, children tend to succeed, not just in school, but throughout life. Um, so my point in saying that is that I think that it's always important to have parents that are involved, but be involved the right way. My daughter is now 18. She's attending Montclair State University, and um, she only goes part-time. She's taking four credit hours, but she's doing that as independently as we can have her do it while keeping her safe. Um, it certainly hasn't been easy. It's been quite bumpy, but I do think that her being included over all these years has benefited her greatly. It has helped her become so much more self-determined. It has helped her really desire to want to be around other people that don't have disabilities as well as people that do, but she is learning how to sort of problem solve and figure this out in a great larger world than just the fishbowl of her little high school. Um, but one of the skills that I learned over the years of trying to help her be included was really how to collaborate with my school district. Over the course of her school career, we never went to mediation, and I never went to due process, and it certainly wasn't because I didn't have reasons to or that I didn't have arguments with my school district. I did on many occasions. What I usually found myself doing is at a time or situation that I had an argument or a disagreement with the school staff, I would sort of take a step back, sort of a breather, and think about what just occurred and say, okay, how is this going to help Laura? Is it going to help Laura if I pursue this? Or is it just going to make me feel better? And the majority of the time, the answer was always, it'll make me feel better. But it's not going to help her. So I would then drop it, because it wasn't about me. It was about her and helping her be included, helping her get the most out of her educational experience, helping her to get down that path I spoke about earlier, to be as independent as she could, to be a contributing member of society, to be able to do a job that she liked, and have some sort of a social connection to others. And me pursuing an argument, a disagreement, somebody that offended myself or Laura, it was, was not an important thing for me to address. It was more important for me to do what I had to keep her included. So sometimes I had to, what you say, kind of take one for the team in order to keep things on a good path. You know, that doesn't mean that I gave in on everything. Certainly there were things that I would not budge on. I was adamant that she be included. I was adamant that supports be brought into the classroom. And I was adamant that we have to think outside the box when things get difficult or the curriculum gets hard. We have to think, how do we bring these supports in? How do we make this work in a situation that will be the best for her? At the same time I say that, I always tell people that I was blessed enough to have a daughter who did not have any significant behavior issues. She didn't have any major medical issues. And those are things that can make a huge factor when you're including somebody. Those were never concerns of ours going through school, and that did make it easier to include her. So um, I do agree very much that you have to work together as much as possible with your team, 
You have to be an involved parent in all ways at the school to help the team look at you as somebody who's not just a parent who wants conflict. So, um, you know, there's lots of other things I can certainly tell you guys offline. You can certainly contact me if you have any other questions about why or how I included my daughter or why I think it works so well. I certainly hope this gave you a very brief overview of inclusion and the benefits of it and the value of it. Certainly was a value and a benefit to my daughter and to many of the students and parents that I work with. So again, I hope this was a beneficial webinar for you. And if you have questions, I will, if I have time, I think I've got about 10, 15 minutes to address questions if there are any. Marianne, it's Melanie. Thank you so much for your time and all the information and personal story that you shared with us. Um, so we do have, have a few questions that came in. Um, the first one is um, we have families that are looking for a copy of the PowerPoint. Is that something that you would be willing to share? Absolutely. Perfect. So um, you and I can connect um, after the session. Uh, we'll find a way to do that, and I'll make sure to email that out to the families um, as soon as we can. Um, so the first question is, can you describe some of the services that NJCIE offers pertaining to educating school districts on inclusive education for students with significant needs? Sure. Um, so NJCIE does a number of things. We have a behavior support staff that will, we usually are not hired by a particular parent. We're hired mainly by school districts. We have found in the past that when parents hire us, school districts don't feel invested in the information we provide for them. So it's usually to the parent and the child's benefit if the school district hires us. You can do that under the law under what's called a consulting service. So you can go to your school district and say that, you know, we, wanna, we want the school to hire a consultant to come in and look at our child and give us, you know, give the school and ourselves a good idea on the ways that he, he or she could be included better. And you can certainly facilitate that by giving them our name, our organization. And we would come in if the school hired us and we would observe the child for a number of days and we would sit down with the teachers, the educators, the support staff, and the parents and sort of try to make a plan for the ways that this child can be included out of the box, in the box, things that work, things that don't work. And we do it in a way that usually school districts don't feel as defensive or as, um, uh, I don't want to keep saying argumentative, but they, they're usually more receptive to it coming from an organization that's trying to work with them as opposed to thinking that it's just a parent trying to dictate a service. Perfect. Thank you so much. And what supports are available for teachers who are not comfortable modifying work for students with uh, disabilities? Well, if it's a gen ed teacher, the, the gen ed teacher should not be modifying the work if it's a child that has an IEP. That is the job of a special education teacher. So if, they have a if a gen ed teacher has a child in their classroom that has an identified disability and part of their IEP is that their work should be modified, and that is supposed to be done by the, gen, the special education teacher, not the gen ed teacher. There should be planning time put into their schedule for the week where they sit down with the special education teacher and they talk about what they're doing with all the kids in the classroom, like the typical kids, what's the curriculum, what's the lesson plan for the week. Then the special education teacher takes that curriculum and modifies it as appropriate for the children that are in that classroom. That's the way that it's supposed to work. It is not supposed to be all the responsibility of a gen ed teacher. The modifications are supposed to be done by a, a special education teacher. Thank you. And there should be plenty of time for that. Um, so the next question is, how should parents respond to the point from administrators that a child has a gap compared to, peers, um, compared to their peers and that the gap cannot be closed? This parent totally agrees with inclusion and has been very resistant to pullouts. The administrators always point out the gap as an issue. Any okay, I, I got that all the time. That was very common. Parents get that all the time. And when I got it, the best way that I handled it was I would always just, you know, totally cop to that. You're right, there's a gap. My daughter's always going to have a gap. She has autism. She's not going to be cured. It's always going to be there. That's not my goal. It was never to close the gap because it was always going to be there, sometimes larger, sometimes smaller, but not always there. My goal was not to close it. My goal was to say, how do we help her have access to the curriculum? That's what the law says she has a right to. In the gen ed classroom is where she's going to have access to that curriculum. So what is going on in the special ed classroom that they think is so special and unique 
that can't happen in a gen ed classroom. Typically, all the supports that are in a special ed classroom are what we call portable. They can be moved to a gen ed classroom. It's just a matter of sitting down and mapping out what goes on during the day, the supports and needs that the child has throughout the day, and moving those into the other environment. Like I showed you with that schedule on that one slide, you really have to break it down if you have to 30 minute or 15 minute increments, but you go through the entire day, you look at what supports are needed during each part of the day, what are they currently doing that's so wonderful over there, and why can't we do that here? Because those supports are all portable. Unless your child has a specific medical or an issue physically that there's something specific to that room that they need. Okay. Um, one parent has a child in high school. Uh, the parent has concerns because the high school is not providing training to the special education teachers. The parent also has a concern because um, there is not money in the budget for this student to receive an individual iPad, even though an evaluation recommends that she has one. I'm assuming that this is for an inclusive classroom. Do you have any suggestions? Okay, there seems like there's more than one question in there. Um, budget issues, legally they're not allowed to tell you they can't provide a service because of a budget issue. But that being said, uh, it's hard to decipher from the question. It said that an iPad was suggested from an evaluation. I'd have to know sort of where the evaluation was coming from. Is that an evaluation from an outside independent evaluator or is that an evaluation that the school gave? If the school did an evaluation and during the course of that evaluation they determined that this child would benefit from an iPad and that was documented, then the school was obligated to provide that particular equipment to you if the school was suggesting that it's necessary. Now if an outside evaluator says, you know, an iPad would be a great tool, the school can sort of take that under advisement. They certainly are under no obligation to provide one. You know, you know, you could always suggest if you have the funds, can we provide an iPad? Can that be used? That's a suggestion you can certainly give. I can't recall the beginning part of that question, Melanie. Sure. It was in regards to training for the special education teachers. I think that you did um, already address that um, in a question regarding the services that NJCIE provides. Yeah, we do do training for school districts, but we have to be hired by the school district. We can do training on all facets of special ed regarding behavior support, you know, how to include a child with an IEP. I do individualized consulting with parents and with school districts, and I train them on how to work with parents. But again, it's usually almost always school district driven. Okay. And um, for that for that parent um, that asked that question in regards to the iPad, they can always call into our office also at 732-528-8080 at the Family Support Center of New Jersey. Um, that's something that we can ask. We would really have to ask uh, some additional questions, I guess, to give you more specific information. But again, if that's a service uh, or a piece of assistive technology that um, your child requires, that's something that we would uh, strongly encourage that you have included in the IEP. Um, so Marianne, I am going to give you one last question. Uh, do you feel that there, oh, I apologize. Do you feel that an awareness component for students within a general education classroom is beneficial? Absolutely, because I always look at it as, the school is a snapshot of what the community is. And when our children become a member of our community, they're not going to be in a community of people who all look the same, who all learn the same, who all behave the same. And so our kids need to learn how to adapt to that, our kids with disabilities and our typical kids. If they're taught in an environment where everybody is the same growing up, whether they have a disability or not, that's what they're going to expect when they get out into the real world. And that's not the reality. So our whole purpose in educating our students is not just to improve their intellect, but it's so they can become independent, contributing members of society. And part of society is learning how to, you know, assimilate there, how to behave, how to know how to handle other people who act and learn at a different rate and a different level than we do, people who need support and people who don't, when to give it and when to back off. Those are all things you learn by being in a classroom of diverse learners. So Marianne, on behalf of the Family Support Center of New Jersey, I want to thank you so much. Um, our thanks goes to you along with NJCIE um, 
And please, for everyone who joined us today, uh, we hope that this gave you a lot of thinking points. We know that inclusive education, like Mary, like Mary Ann said in the beginning, is not for everyone, but everyone should consider this for their child. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to give us a call at the Family Support Center of New Jersey office. Again, at 732-528-8080. Please feel free to check out our website for any upcoming webinars or in-person trainings. And Marianne, I'll make sure to connect with you to get that PowerPoint and some of those additional resources that you were talking about. And we'll get that emailed out to all of our attendees. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. your time. Thank you on behalf of everyone here. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.